It's so good to be back in the recording studio. I just returned from New York last week, and I'm headed to Miami tomorrow. So traveling is really getting in the way of my podcast. I want to talk for one minute about going to New York, since we're talking about running out of money. I happened to stay at the Equinox, and I had no idea how nice it was. It's one of the nicest hotels in New York City, and along with an amazing view and an amazing facility comes a big price tag. And because I was thinking about this episode, I couldn't help but wonder if some of the people in that study of the 80% that were fearing running out of money were possibly staying there. I mean, it's just so interesting how out of control so many people's primal brain is, so much wanting to enjoy the moment and not an ability to get their prefrontal cortex engaged to where they can enjoy now as well as in the future. It kind of got me thinking about today's episode. In a recent study, 80% of the people they researched shared that they feared running out of money. And that is just staggering. And when you start looking at some of the other numbers, like 40% of people rely entirely on Social Security And it's really interesting because my peers and I think that number is actually higher. But when you think about running out of money, it's not on most people's bucket list. And yet so many people worry about it. But what I find fascinating is that a lot of people are worried about it, but I don't see people doing a lot about it. There's nothing fun about running out of money. In another study, people share that they were more afraid of running out of money than dying. So in addition to the concern of running out of money, If you look at people living in poverty over the age of 65, almost 75% of them are women. And many of them were not broke or poor while married or working. So again, it's just something to be aware of. And if you want to know what you need to do to avoid running out of money, you're going to love today's episode. So please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Annette Ba'u, host of the Wealth Inside and Out podcast and founder of The Millionaire Insider. My mission is to help you simplify the money game so you can create a financially secure and fulfilled life without having to have a PhD or spend countless hours on your finances. You're going to learn how to think like a millionaire, stop worrying about money and wondering if your financial house is truly in order and instead spend your time doing what you love. With over three decades advising seven, eight, and even nine figure millionaires, and now joining that elite group, I'm in a unique position to help you make the best financial choices so you can create a secure financial future and retirement you love. This is the Wealth Inside and Out podcast. If you need help on your next best financial move, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. That's an assessment that's going to help you determine what you should do next. Our free guide is our financial freedom formula. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash FFG. But this guide provides critical insight to help you secure your financial future as well as your retirement. It breaks it down into three different areas so that you can really look at your inner game, which includes your worth barometer, your goals, your mission, your game plan, what your strategy is going to be, and then the execution. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash FFG. For today's show notes, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash 55. All materials and intellectual property are copywritten by themillionaireseries.com. This information is not intended to replace any advisor or specialist or to provide you any investment, financial, tax, retirement, planning, or healthcare advice. All participants agree to hold millionaireseries.com and its affiliates harmless for results achieved or not achieved. In the blog, I dive into three more practical reasons people run out of money. I encourage you to go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash 55 to get that insight. But today, what I wanted to share with you are three surprising reasons, ones that most people would never imagine. So let's dive in. The first one is that you are successful. Now you're going, wait a minute, what? The reason success is a problem is that most of us that are successful are busy, right? And I can remember going to my first coach that I had, and she asked me if I was busy. And I remember I was so proud to tell her that, yes, of course I'm busy because I'm successful. And I'll never forget her response. She said, we can work on that. 
I was like, what? She proceeded to share with me that busyness is as addictive and as problematic as overdrinking, overeating, things that we know are not ideal. It was just mind boggling to me because I always just thought, oh, being busy was so good. Now I kind of cringe at it. Unfortunately, I am busy. A lot of the reasons I'm busy is because of choices I've made from blogging at the Millionaire Insider to hosting this podcast, to traveling, to you know, making my family and kids a priority, to working out, to really eating healthy. All those things add up to a busy life. But the other issue that's a problem when we're busy is that we don't have the time required to do the work, to manage our affairs, to create the plan. And so what ends up happening is we either ignore it or as bad as ignoring it is delegating it and then abdicating it. So we delegate it to either maybe our partner or to an advisor, and then we abdicate it, meaning we're not paying attention because we don't have time. Being successful has a lot of advantages, but it also has some major problems, and it can dramatically impact the quality of our life in retirement. The second is being smart. The problem with SMART is because oftentimes a person is successful in one area, we think, well, if we're smart in this area, we're a great surgeon, we're a great business owner, whatever we are, therefore we are brilliant in this area. What's so interesting is that when you think about money, there are so many people who have no formal training, have no knowledge, and yet they handle all the money, make all the money decisions. Sometimes it can be absolutely disastrous if they don't have the proper knowledge and training and education. So I want you to think about this for one minute. So if I said, well, I have to go in for surgery on Friday, and let's just say I'm having my gallbladder removed, and people are like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, my husband's going to do the surgery. People would be like, what? I'm like, he's not a surgeon, but yeah, he's going to just do it. I mean, people would be like, this is insane, right? This is a problem. I mean, he could be, I'm sure, you know, get in trouble by the board of doctors, <laughs> surgeons, whatever they're called. But yeah, when it comes to money, unlike so many other professions, it's just kind of like assumed that you know that stuff. And it's kind of like, oh, my husband handles that. And it's like, there's no questions asked, right? But the problem is when someone is not qualified and they don't know what they are doing, it is It can be just as devastating as having surgery by someone who doesn't know what they're doing. What I typically find is that the burden of managing money is often on the man. It's just assumed that men know about money, even though they haven't gotten any more training a lot of times than women. What I find as far as women goes is sometimes they don't give themselves enough credit. Like they're nervous to ask a question or they've asked a question and the advisor has spoken down to them or acted like that's a dumb question. We got to be aware that SMART is an issue. So another problem with SMART is that when we're bright, a lot of times our primal brain, which is that old brain, that two million year old brain that's there to protect us, that's emotionally driven, because we're smart or we're a genius in some area and we have an out of control limbic primal toddler brain, We don't realize that we've got to let our prefrontal cortex get caught up to help us be smart in the other area. And so it's kind of like we're running on this emotional basis where we make emotional decisions, we make spur of the moment, we do what we feel like doing, and that can wreak havoc when it comes to your money, right? And what a lot of times you'll see happens with those kind of people is because they're really smart and they're making a lot of money right now, they get on this dopamine loop. They make money and then they spend it in their business to make more or they spend it in their personal life, oftentimes to look like they have money. I mean, it's just a vicious cycle. And what ends up happening is they never pause long enough to let their prefrontal cortex catch up or kick in. And so they just keep going and going and going thinking, I can always work or, you know, I'm smart enough to figure it out. And yet there are so many women that I have met whose plan was to keep working, but because they became disabled or sick, they're not able to. Number three, you don't love the details. And oftentimes that's where we lack patience, right? When we're bigger picture focused, we often do the minimal work 
and focus on the big picture. I mean, many of us do not like those minuscule details. Oh, it can just be so disastrous because as one of the attorneys I work with always says, the devil is in the details. You've got to have somebody paying attention to those details. And then tied to not loving the details a lot of times is, which I mentioned before, is we delegate and abdicate. So we delegate to our partner or we delegate to an advisor, and then we just ignore it. We just want everything to be okay, right? Because we're busy. We don't like details. We don't have the time. Ooh, it's a kiss of death. Now, sometimes this happens in marriages, and I'm going to give you an example. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the fourth step. In this particular situation, a woman who had been a stay-at-home mom her whole life, did not have a lot of knowledge in money, married to a CPA. He inherited a million dollars from his mom. She inherited a million dollars from her mom. The husband, which was a CPA, managed it. So when I met her, her husband had just filed for divorce. And I'm like, what happened? She said, well, I got a million dollars and he did too. And I didn't know that for the last 10 years, we've been living solely on my mom's money. And now that trust is completely bankrupt. There's no money in it. He still has his million, and now he filed for divorce. Now, this was the catch-all. This was the part of this that bothered me even more than that part was the fact that she wouldn't do anything about it. And I said, I think you have a very strong case to file a complaint, even be able to pierce it and get half of those assets. She would not do it. So here she was, destitute, having to go back to work at over age 60, And he's living this great life. I mean, it's just unbelievable. She could have delegated, but then not abdicated. It would have been a very, very different story. Another case, the woman had about 85 million. Her husband died. Her and her husband's CPA of 20 years took over managing the money. She got a call from her alma mater saying, your $2 million check bounced. And at that point, she found out that the CPA had stolen somewhere in the tune of $80 million. It was fine when her husband was alive. Why? Because he was not abdicating. Even though he delegated some, he was still paying attention. When you delegate and abdicate, the odds are that it's going to be a problem are much more likely. So if you're going to delegate, just don't abdicate. Number four, your partner is busy. Oftentimes what happens is one party takes over the money, right? And a lot of times it's the man, but sometimes it's the woman. You're delegating to them and they're busy, so they don't have time to handle it either. So that is a big problem. The second one is they're not an expert. Like, where do people become money experts? I have worked with people who are in the financial industry or who are attorneys or who are doctors or surgeons at the top of their game. And They do not know many things about money because they have not been formally trained in that area. So we've got to realize that because I'm an expert in this area does not mean I'm an expert with money. And that can be absolutely devastating. So you have to be aware of that. The third one, which we've dove into in the example of delegate and abdicate, is you get divorced. And that can be absolutely problematic, especially if you are living in a non-community property state, or if your partner brought assets in to the marriage and they're not included in your joint assets. you got to know what's going on. And one of the things that always amazes me, it just amazes me, I can't tell you how many times I have heard this. People will say, you can't imagine the prenup my partner made me sign. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Your partner didn't make you sign anything. You chose to sign it. And with Any prenup, you have to acknowledge that you've either been recommended to consult with an attorney or that you have. So it was your choice to sign it. And the time to negotiate those things is before you get married. And I will just say this much. I have had people who have had, I mean, horrific prenups. It's like, hey, you sign this, you get married, you are just basically locked into a problem if you ever get divorced especially when one of the partners is not going to work. I can remember 
with one of my boyfriends. He said to me, he said, so once we get married, what are you going to do? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm going to work. I mean, I change people's lives. And I remember it was the most interesting thing. And then I also remember that he was talking about a prenup. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I definitely want a prenup if we got married because I want to be really clear on how much money I'm going to get if we get divorced. And it was kind of like, I could just see it was kind of going through his mind. He was thinking like, wow, she's thought this through. I think, again, you've got to look at the situation. Obviously, my husband and I both came into it with significant assets. So it's a little different than if one person has significant assets and the other doesn't. But then you also have to take into account who's taking care of the kids, who's doing what. So you got to just be aware of all those things. But you want to make sure that if you are delegating to your partner that you know what's going on so that if you do get divorced, you're not going to be harmed financially. Another issue that's a problem is that the assets are in your spouse's name. And this is especially a problem if it's a non-community property state. And I see that all the time. And it's just so interesting. And it's because most people don't understand. And then they're like, oh, but I'm payable on death. Well, it doesn't matter if you're payable on death. It matters who owns those assets. The person on the title owns them. And then sometimes the assets pass via beneficiary. You've got to be sure that all your assets are coordinated to tie into what your estate plan says as far as distribution assets and that you are definitely going to have the assets you think you're going to have because there are a lot of people who have no idea. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who find out when it's too late that they don't have assets. I was just talking to a realtor. She was appointed by the court because this husband and wife are getting divorced and the wife had no idea that her husband had owned all this real estate. They're getting divorced and they couldn't agree on prices. So the court named a person that's going to go sell all the real estate and then split the assets. But she had no idea that her partner had all these assets and he had them in his name. But because Arizona is a community property state, she gets half of them. Another thing that happens when you delegate, say, to your partner. And let's just say your partner is a stand-up person and everything's taken care of and they do a great job. They get the education, the knowledge. A lot of times what happens in that scenario is if the partner dies prematurely or the partner dies before you, what happens is you hire a new advisor. And nine times out of 10, you'll see that person do the exact same thing they did with their partner. If they delegated and abdicated, they'll do the same thing. The problem is that new advisor, whether it's the CPA of 20 years or it's a financial advisor or whomever it is, doesn't always have your best interest at heart. So you've got to make sure that if you delegate, you don't abdicate. So there you have it. So let's recap. Number one, if you're successful, you're busy, you're smart, you don't have the time, you got to make sure that you take the time, that you do the necessary work to create a plan so you know what's going on. Just because you're smart in this area does not mean you're a genius in that area. So just like you probably wouldn't go do surgery or or go fly a plane if you didn't have qualifications, it's the same thing when it comes to money. And then if you don't love the details or you lack patience, you've got to at least delegate but not abdicate. You can find somebody that can help you, but you don't ignore it. You don't go to sleep at the wheel. And then if you are delegating to your partner, you got to make sure that things are still taken care of. So you still can't abdicate it. So I'm telling you, there's nothing fun about finding out that your partner has died or the partner is filed for divorce or having an affair. And now you're in a situation where you find out all the assets aren't in your name or you find out that you didn't even know he had assets, whatever the scenario may be. So just be aware of it. So there you have it. If you love the content of this podcast, please follow and subscribe to our channel so you get notified of episodes and also give us a five-star review and share a comment. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on taking another step to create a financially free life you love. If you're not sure about your financial future or that it's in order or you are ready to stop worrying about money or possibly the fear of becoming a bag lady, ending up broke in retirement, or you simply are ready to know your financial house is in order, 
so that you can have a bright financial future, please go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. And that doesn't stand for non-sufficient funds. It stands for next step finance. It's the next best step of what you need to do so you can avoid an NSF notice in your future. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. 